quick interview with you. When did you start uh, using Java? Uh, that is a very good question. Um, not that much after something like J2EE came around. So I've uh -huh. not been one of the first Java users ever, meaning as in the JDK. I had played around with applets and uh, I, mm -hmm. I think I pretty much started around the 1996, 97, 1970 timeframe, uh, 79, wow. Jesus. But um, yeah, we're getting old, um, all of us, I guess. <laughs> uh, so I, th I think like my most serious, like first serious encounter actually started with the enterprise platform itself. Mm -hmm. Everything before that was, was more like, yeah, playing around, right? For me, it's interesting actually, because, you know, I started uh, to learn that at university and uh, at that time, Java 1.4, I think was around, but I never used it in production and uh, actually switched to other languages, C, C++ and all others. But my first uh, paid job was with Java and that was right after um, Java, 1.8 was announced and uh, it turned out that I worked with 1.8 uh, for a period and then I switched to Scala and for me all the struggles if I would uh, like to come back to Java I know that <clears throat> from yesterday's keynote and yesterday's panel about Java 8 I know that uh, I would still be like aware of all the features because most of the uh, companies still use uh, 1.8. So uh, speaking of which, uh, which uh, version do you use normally day by day uh, now? I think I'm I'm comparably constrained to what our customers are using. Yes. Um, when I do my personal demos, um, I don't care that much. And I'm trying to stick with the latest supported from Red Hat, obviously. So not even latest uh, available. Mm -hmm. um, mm, I, I think my um, my relation with Java as a programming language has changed on the professional side of the last couple of years for reasons. And I'm, I'm probably going to dig into that in my talk a little bit. Um, so ultimately uh, that lets me stick with like the standard features mm -hmm. uh, wherever I can. Um, I think most frameworks and supported kind of versions uh, somewhat stick to Java 11 anyway. Um, so just thinking that there's a Java 16 on the horizon uh, makes me cringe a little bit because I personally still think uh, the pace is way too high, um, especially on the enterprise side of the things. But uh, yeah, that said, I'm, uh, I'm kind of following the latest developments. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but yeah, not, not a lot more than playing around with them. Uh, professional setting is mostly bound to Java 11 and below, honestly. I see. So you're a uh, developer adoption lead uh, at Red Hat, is that correct? That is correct, yes. So what's your, uh, like, I uh, assume that you have a good overview of how people actually adopt the um, technology in general, not only Java, I think. So what's your uh, vision for now? What's the uh, like technologies that you think are our future? Yeah, that is actually a good question um, that I don't hear that much. And uh, guess what? We're going to talk about it in the talk a little bit. Uh, yeah. So I'm, I'm digging comparably deep, uh, but uh, just as a little bit of a teaser. So I, I think if we um, take, a, take a relaxing sit back and uh, think about what happened over the past 10, 15 years, um, things have shifted aggressively towards infrastructure in general. And the massive amount of work that developers have to handle in their day-to-day -day life um, basically is anything but coding, right? So there's a lot of understanding infrastructure, understanding the layers, configuring even like third-party systems, making sure um, all the, let's say, all outer architecture for now. So like messaging systems or 
um, databases are kind of available on like, yeah, it feels like bare metal again, even if it's containers and Kubernetes and there's a lot of heavy lifting underneath. Um, the, the difference for us became like, there's a lot more to actually handle than to just implement a servlet um, to keep it that simple. Because back in the days, we didn't really had a care about what happened to this like Java class. Once it's compiled, the application server actually know what to do. So what uh, we see um, with customers um, is that the old and the new world are starting to collide very frequently because especially when uh, we have a customer who's adopting latest and greatest on the infrastructure side, mm -hmm. it's mostly also driven by infrastructure people. So developers who are eager to use these kind of new technologies and build modernish applications on top of that, um, they're having a hard time to get what they need or even get access to it as they want to because some companies still treat it as like ops only, right? So what, what I think is, uh, is about to happen in the next couple of years is a, is a closer relationship between exactly these two kind of organizational parts. So we do have DevOps, we do have DevSecOps, we have all kinds of fancy words for processes that should technically mitigate these kind of problems. But as a matter of fact, and, and I think this is what I'm, I'm still seeing with a lot of customers, um, we're struggling to put this into some kind of productive environment at scale mostly. And uh, I think this is exactly what's what's going to happen. We're going to see a lot more blended offerings. The whole infrastructure part is probably going to take a step back in general in the eyes and hands of developers because hopefully uh, we as developers get a focus a little bit more on what our sole purpose and my personal fun is. I want to want to write code. I want to solve yeah. business problems. And configuring Kafka is not one of these business problems, right? So, and uh, I, I think that's the trend we're seeing. So people are putting a lot more effort into uh, coming back to that kind of seamless experience uh, for developers in particular. All right, it's actually time to start your uh, keynote. And I'm really excited and thrilled. And I love the uh, title of your uh, uh, keynote because unicorns <laughs> what actually happens when unicorns drink coffee and you drink coffee uh, will we see the unicorns <laughs> we will see a couple of um but uh, yeah let's let's see how we can how we can uh, make this an entertaining story okay um, welcome thank and you. take it away Wonderful, I will, thank you. I have to admit, uh, so when Ali asked me if, uh, if I want to keynote uh, J-Love, I, uh, I was hesitating for many reasons actually, because um, I've never done that many keynotes in the Java space and uh, this obviously put me out of my comfort zone. On the other hand, um, I definitely have given plenty of presentations in the past and uh, let me see if we can flip the slides over. We can. So I think I'm, I'm not counting, but 150 plus probably um, technology mostly. Um, I, I think containers, microservices, like pretty much every year, you could say buzzword um, that was uh, part of our all daily enterprise developers lives in the last almost 15 years. And I was looking for, for a new approach. Um, so I, I hope you're going to like it. Um, this is going to be a very personal keynote. Um, I am going to tell you a couple of personal stories that I rarely shared before with anybody. And uh, maybe this is taking you on a little bit of a journey. So what uh, the abstract said is, is actually something that I really would like to achieve. I wanna get you thinking today and uh, I want to want to give you a couple of like ideas where to look for next opportunities and in, in making the world better. Everything is open source, so all of us can actually contribute. Um, I, I'm a software developer at heart, right? So I've uh, I've done this like software development thingy uh, for companies 
for more than 14 years. This is, even if I'm getting older, this is still the lion's share of my professional career. Um, most of the time it's been automotive uh, industry, which is kind of a no brainer for a German living in like Southern Germany. Um, I've spent a lot of time in finance and banking, uh, especially when it comes to core systems and uh, algorithms around how to like calculate things. And uh, if I say things, I mean massive amounts of uh, in terms of portfolio um, calculations and uh, maybe even historic stuff that we need to look at um, to report actual numbers. I've also looked at another conservative industry, which uh, were the insurances, where I, as a developer, um, actually started. So that has been my first professional paid for gig ever um, at a Munich reinsurance uh, that uh, was looking for some data analytics. Um, and as a reinsurance is like the the backing um, entity of a first insurance that we all like as individuals probably have contracts with. Um, they're looking at bigger things, bigger disasters. So that was uh, interesting uh, because I've never had any kind of contact with these kind of topics before. Long story short, um, while working for one of these automotive OEMs, um, I uh, I was getting I was getting promoted. So I started out working at on JSP pages, basically designing web UIs uh, on top of the first versions of uh, WebLogic Server. And uh, over time, I ended up being a principal architect. So I I pretty much followed that poster child kind of role uh, from <laughs> dishwasher software developer all the way up to some kind of principal architect guy. Uh, who is leading teams uh, of massive amounts of like people and uh, the biggest team was probably 200 people uh, that I that I had to give like technical direction for and guess what happened um, I, I basically I mean that's a no-brainer I burned out so I slept not more than four hours uh, a day and uh, still had to drive all the way every morning get to that customer solve problems work 13 hours and, and go back to sleep another four year, uh, four hours my uh, my oldest girl was born um everything like in personal life turned upside down and uh, i did think a lot about next steps and what i want to do and one part has always been sharing what i've learned so i started blogging became a java champion um, I've, I've gone through a couple of things and I thought DevRel, um, like sharing what I know, that might be the right thing. And I've done that for a couple of years and guess what, I burned out. <laughs> so um, maybe that's a personal problem. Maybe I'm just too enthusiastic about things that I'm doing. Um, but the opposite side, I also like got older over time. So it's not been as deep of depth and it's not been that really hides that I had in my youth anymore. But long story short, um, I still ended again in that kind of developer relations role, even if it's more focused on our customers and enabling them uh, as in Red Hat, which is my professional side of the house. Um, but I've always been part of the Java community at heart because I love what Java has created. Um, and if you know me a little bit, if you've heard about uh, big events in the Java community happening, you're also pretty aware of Java land, which has also been like a side effect of my, um, um, my, my creations over time in terms of like community enablement conferences. By now it's a complete separate team running it and I couldn't be more proud of the, the result of this conference. So whenever we get to like back to real uh, events happening uh, physically, this is happening in a theme park. So we can't really miss that. Is that enough about me? Yes, I think so. Um, but I still would like to go a little bit more personal because I still need to get back to that unicorns, right? So I already have coffee. Let's see how we get unicorns into all of this. So this is one of the rare pictures of my kids where I can even briefly spot parts of the face of my oldest one on the left. And they are already asking me to get back to traveling. So I'm obviously already annoying the shit out of them sitting at home and like doing video conferences all day. But uh, yeah, we'll get there. 
This picture, obviously, out of times, better times, some would say, where we were still allowed to travel. Um, and they were, they were having a blast. Um, they are writing since more than four years by now. Um, and they had to learn a lesson. So writing is something that you can't just get a certificate for. Writing is something that you need practice for, that you need a lot of knowledge. You need to know how to feed horses. You know how to like spot illnesses. You need to know how body language works because you can't communicate with these wonderful, um, wonderful horses. Um, yeah, long story short, um, the two have embarked on that journey and they've learned a lot. And uh, I think what, uh, what is important to me is that this kind of journey by experience, by taking a lot of rides at beaches and on streets in, in forests and God knows what, they gained this experience over time. And they had to accept that just getting some kind of certificate is not bringing them where they want to be as professional writers. And I somehow want to compare this to us as software developers. So if we look back at our career, like, yes, you can take courses and they will definitely kickstart your career. But at the end of the day, you need to have personal experiences with what you're doing. And you need to yeah, delete a database in production at some point um, to feel the pain, what it means to actually make mistakes. Um, but while my kids are kind of my synonym today for um, us as developers, I also wanna, wanna briefly look at, at the evolution of horses because obviously that starts to play a big role in our all daily lives, especially over here uh, while I'm the stay at home dad. Um, and uh, I think it's, it's another wonderful parable um, that we can use over Horses basically evolved over a time frame of 50 million years from that little dark sized thingy on the left to the full blown version uh, that is called a modern horse as of today. And uh, what, is, what is actually interesting is most of this development has happened in North America until about like 10,000 years ago where they basically gone extinct in North America and the rest of the development happened in the rest of the world. I'm not going to draw any political conclusions out of that. Uh, nobody knows where that happened, by the way. Um, there's speculations around climate crisis or God knows what, but um, it's interesting. So if you're a little interested in, in getting to know a little bit more about horses, um, that would definitely be an interesting area to explore. Um, what I think I wanted to get at, and we're, we're trying to stick to uh, software development here. I'm, I'm trying hard, believe me. Um, I think when my kids were the parable for software developers, these the horse evolution is kind of my parable today for systems, methodologies, and architectural development over time that we've seen. And uh, I'll, I'll spare you me spelling out Greek names because I can't do that. Um, I just gave you a couple of hints on the top of the slides. This is basically the first iteration, dark sized kind of, kind of like mini horses, uh, the Dawn horse. I think this is, could be a synonym for the first applications, maybe even the first computers, Z3, Conrad Sousa, um, that was 1964. Um, and yes, I'm reading these dates because I haven't learned them uh, by heart. But this is kind of like the first iteration of the internet. This is kind of where ARPANET got finally closed down and went from 1% um, um, share for the international communication all the way up to like 25%. Uh, when Java was born in 1995. So this is kind of like the very, very, very early, uh, early stuff. Um, and I, I, I've, I'm reading quite a couple of tweets these days um, whenever I, I get like five minutes between the two uh, picking up another fight at home. And uh, one question came up, like, what was your first internet connection ever? 
And I had to think about this because I was probably late to the game. Uh, so I've never been using one of these acoustic hopplers. Um, I've always been all bought into ISDN. And so I got a first like uh, PCMI card. Uh, so I had like a dial-up connection via ISDN the first uh, couple of years. Um, that was uh, 64 kilobits, right? So um, that's not like really fast. A couple of years later, I got an ASCAN router and got like a double ISDN number that bumped it up to 120, uh, 128 kilobits per second. So that's been with a full-blown subnet, funny enough. Um, and this uh, full-blown like internationally visible uh, subnet, uh, that brought me into trouble a couple of years later, um, but uh, maybe I'll get to tell that story. So I actually had a house search uh, because that subnet that was uh, that was penciled into my name for five, six years, even when I went down to Munich uh, and started my studies. Uh, yeah, police knocked at my door and uh, wanted to search my, my house because uh, they found some breakages uh, somewhere from that IP subnet that I haven't put my hands on in many, many years before that. So that was my funny internet uh, beginning story of the, of the time. Um, I wasn't really part of, of this at all. Like this is where I started kind of my, my experiences, my developer journey. And to me personally, back in the days, it was mostly Perl and everything that um, had something to do with early like internet functionality. So um, I bought vacuum cleaner finding pages, like all kinds of weird shit that companies came up with whenever they found out that the internet could be an interesting place to be. The next kind of evolution um, is what is commonly called the middle horse, um, uh, still many, many million years out. But uh, to me, this is uh, a synonym for a couple of things. First of all, this is where I really started professionally developing software. This is where uh, waterfall models were a state of the art. This is also where we started um, developing practices around object-oriented programming for the first time ever. Everybody was thinking about fat client kind of uh, applications um, that might have been Java, but most of the time I think it's actually been small talk. And uh, I vividly remember uh, one of my beloved coworkers back in the days who refused to give up small talk for Java because it was so much better and so much easier. And still small talk did not win that battle. Um, that's also been uh, the times of the, the physical service, right? So the mainframes out there, the first physical whatever kind of thing is running some kind of computations. And, uh, I, I heard rumors that there, there are still enough mainframes out there um, heavily guarded because there's nothing going on in today's modern world without these mainframes backing everything, especially in the comparably conservative um, industries that I mentioned earlier. And all of this obviously was running in, uh, in data centers, right? So what I found noticeably thinking about what this time back in the days meant for devs it meant that we had to like completely ignore, almost completely ignore the infrastructure all of our applications were running on. So we've had the pleasure to just focus on our business logic. And there's been specialized operation teams that we can talk to and push our stuff over. And yes, generalizations are always bad. So you'll definitely prove me wrong easy by just telling me one or two stories. But as the greater scheme of things, this has been the very joyful area of software development where like business functionality uh, was developed together with the methodologies around how to handle big sized software projects and how to scale our knowledge in, in the right way. <clears throat> the next kind of evolution um, that I went through is uh, what's called the, the ruminant horse. And uh, honestly, it's not ruminant, it's never been, and uh, it will never be. So just as like a little side note, um, agile as, my, as my, my hate topic 
as uh, it's still sparking discussions everywhere. So it must have been a good kind of thingy whenever that came up. It changed so many conversations towards the better, um, especially in, in corporate, uh, uh, corporate settings where customers wanted to buy individual software that needed like a solution for something that nobody else has off the shelf software and that they basically had to create their own stuff and they needed vendors delivering that. So the waterfall model was the, the poster child of project planning and estimation, right? So it's been endless spreadsheets that I can remember where we like mathematically generated uh, medians and just estimated large amounts of what that project will actually take in terms of uh, full-time equivalents uh, or like people hours in general. So Agile changed that game significantly. Um, customers still did not understand what it, what it really means. And some of them might not today, but uh, it's, it's been a very vibrant time because things like Visual Source Safe had to be replaced. Uh, we started working with uh, enterprise Java servers, right? So uh, J2EE came around the corner. Um, whoever remembered together Control Center, which uh, was the, the first full-blown IDE, uh, who was technically able to generate a full container managed persistence uh, layer. Um, this is also like the epoch where, where Spring was born ultimately. So it's been, it's been right here. So back in the days, it was born because J2EE was too complex and we needed something more than just the object oriented principles um, to actually solve our da daily problems. The growing complexity started to kick in. And I think, um, so I revisited a couple of my really old presentations. Um, it's funny that PowerPoint is still open, uh, still able to open them, but uh, it is. And I was looking at the um, amount of pages in the enterprise Java specification documents. And that went from like a couple of like 30, 20, uh, to hundreds of pages uh, in, in enterprise Java seven or eight, I haven't counted eight, honestly. But yeah, long story short, complexity started to kick in. Um, we started to find ways to build frameworks and find solutions to this. Um, there's been virtualized infrastructure. So we finally had a way of provisioning service and uh, it's it's been procurement has been a lot easier going forward it's not been mainframes that had to be ordered like years in advance but it's still been very challenging in general um what i like the most is uh, this is the platform age or what i call the platform age when i'm making this up um but people basically had to decide if they want to um, use sap if they want to use microsoft or if they want to buy in all on Java platforms. So from a complexity standpoint, uh, for a developer, you basically had to pick one of three, right? So uh, you just went with that and uh, you did what you had to do. You learned and uh, you created beautiful applications. And I did. So we got to ignore hardware, another kind of epoch long because it's been mostly standard installations, maybe a load dispatcher, maybe two cluster instances. And that's been it besides some like more fancy installations with a lot more uh, load on it, but the internet was still growing, remember? So that was still all very predictable ultimately. What I also remember is a story where I probably first screwed up like big time because um, we were building a used car finder back in the days. And uh, because we, we loved every new technology that we could get in our hands, we started uh, building this new thingy with Hibernate, um, established back in the days, um, mature already, and uh, just not supported by, by WebLogic server. So they, it came with its own kind of like, I think it was top link or something else. Um, so yeah, we decided we wanted Hibernate because it's cooler, it supports a couple of more features that we need. And uh, yeah, that uh, definitely broke my back back in the days because we couldn't get a supported configuration running at all. And uh, nobody really wanted to take on the support burden for this, um, just a neat little side story. Um, 
what's next? Um, next evolution for me personally is, is something that I kind of squeezed into all of this. Um, it's the, the, the more horse, like a little bit more the modern horse. Um, it's a development continuously improving what we learned over time. So we started pushing agile to the limits. We started to adopt it in like governmental settings, uh, especially in Germany, well known as the V model XT, um, something that is still like the defined status if you want to develop software for uh, the German government. This methodology you need to look at, into. Um, we started to create monsters. We started to use uh, enterprise service buses. Uh, we decided that everything has to be a service now. Uh, we were overusing web services uh, at an extent that XML was uh, actually becoming to look nice and tasty, uh, which it should never have. But knowing what I know today uh, and having seen YAML, I probably should have paid more attention to XML and should have said thank you a couple of more times. We learned how to how to scale ESBs. Um, we've been fighting complexity. Um, back in the days, nothing was set in stone anymore. Um, <laughs> BEA WebLogic even came up with a brand new um, brand for uh, their products. Ultimately, it was called AquaLogic. And uh, I think I wrote like a seven or eight piece uh, article series about these individual integration solutions and, and data shifters and God knows what what was part of this big package. And customers were, were struggling to get that into place. And if they had it into place and if it was working, they ultimately had to start uh, thinking about scaling it. Thankfully, it was uh, all more or less t-shirt sized infrastructures already. So operations had a really good handle on how to get these virtualized infrastructures up and running. Um, and it was it was pretty easy uh, to get these rolled out in like various instances for test and integration and production. And uh, we developers really like we thought about infrastructure a little bit more, especially when people started thinking about these private clouds, uh, everything as a service um, is also kind of a synonym for, platform as a service, um, software as a service, like everything was AAS, right? So, um, and that is a deliberate double meaning at that point. So we, we really, it started to get in the way. Um, I've seen a couple of neat APIs coming out of these as a service kind of offerings. I've seen a lot more crap and it got really hard to make this a good fit for an overall application architecture that had to scale to a certain extent. And that was something that kind of surprised me. But still, here we are at the modern horse, right? So this is when it comes to pictograms on the screen, this is probably state of the art. This is GitOps, this is DevSecOps, this is DevOps, this is like domain-driven design. This is everything that we know today about microservices and distributed applications packaged up in containers, and obviously it all goes to the clouds, right? So um, I think the modern horse, as of today, you all know what we're struggling with in general. Um, it looks good on paper, um, but following the, um, the whole epoch of horses over time, with all the technical details I shared, uh, I think it's safe to say at this point that infrastructure literally has taken over developer complexity. So we have only a fraction of our time to focus on building something that has business value. And a lot of time goes into plumbing and infrastructure and making sure this is actually working. So the required knowledge over time of all the various layers and how things actually work uh, this has become a burden to many. And I spoke to many uh, like young guns in the field who've been complaining and they've been trying to understand Kubernetes and they've been trying to look into what containers are. And uh, they are starting to slowly realize 
how this is layered and what kind of like complex knowledge is required to navigate this system. So it's, it's interesting, right? Companies are, are struggling with this in many ways. And I'm not only speaking about Red Hat customers, um, but I definitely speak about the people I see and speak to every day. And uh, there's traditional companies with traditional processes. Um, let's assume it's a bank. Um, let's assume they've always had some kind of like approval process for infrastructures or even applications going into production. They need to make sure they adhere to certain metrics and security checks before. And uh, DevOps comes away and uh, tells everybody, hey, um, this is what you have to do, right? Give me my production environment and I'll get that pushed out because we need a new version of a new service. So th this is like worlds colliding. And I think um, this is also something that we learned over time that the point we're at is kind of an early age, is something where where we start to learn new things and where we start to handle things in the right way. I have to admit the, the whole um, evolution of horses uh, took roughly 50 million years. Um, the evolution of software development and infrastructures and like enterprise development, uh, that's been a retro retrospective perspective of about like 15 years for now. So it's, it's, it's completely exploded um, coming from a standard like JDK uh, development language to something that is covering almost every nitty gritty part of the infrastructure in total, right? So there's almost no simple guidelines. There's a lot of information available, but in general, you have to make your own experiences and you have to try things out. Um, there are a couple of interesting blueprints that you can look at, and there's a lot of work that's been done that is not even public, and that is super exciting because it does exactly fulfill that promise, live that dream that the modern horse actually wants, to, uh, wants us to sell. For many, it still means waking up in that kind of like labyrinth and not really knowing where to go next. And there's, there's plenty of things that uh, I think Gartner coined that term and I'm still using it. I'm not, not even sure if it's a, a thing, but I, I like its expressiveness that started moving from these platforms into, into the infrastructure and these outer architecture aspects. Um, that is all something that we as developers can no longer take for granted. Um, our application servers are mostly gone, especially in that brave new microservices world. Um, so we have to find solutions to transactions. Is that even a thing? Maybe we need business transactions. Maybe we need some new guidance when it comes to handling business failures in these distributed systems. I think what I realized in these kind of infrastructures as a developer, um, uh, the, the, more, the smaller my responsibilities uh, become, the more the more concrete the individual services implementations are, the easier it was for me as a developer to feel at home and to find some kind of context in, in this whole thing. The happier I was. Um, this is a personal trait. I'm not saying this is true for everybody. I can just imagine there are a couple of more like me out there. Um, what I think is uh, that is something that we need to, need to take a, a further look at, right? So making sure people have the abilities and knowledge uh, about how to build solid modern applications. And this is an answer from, from Red Hat at that point. It's, it's a wonderful kind, of, uh, wonderful kind of marketing slide. And uh, I use it a lot, honestly, because I think it beautifully captures the responsibilities of us as developers peered around the most important parts and bits and pieces that we need to handle. And uh, it's, still, it's still just a fraction of what's actually needed to have a full blown development life cycle in a containerized distributed applications world, right? Um, I think it's, it's really important to realize 
what we are embarking on with this journey. And this is another beautiful example of a modern, what should I even call that, software development life cycle? Yeah, maybe. Um, so we started with an IDE, uh, some kind of source code, building local artifacts, testing them, and giving them to ops. And uh, now we're starting to work our way through uh, from the source code to the local tests, to unit tests, to container tests. We're thinking about which repository do we want uh, this all to reside? Where do we put our infrastructure information? How do we trigger new builds uh, in the infrastructure? And uh, forgive me that OpenShift is mentioned as the only Kubernetes runtime on this slide. Um, this is intentional, but uh, obviously not the truth. Um, but it's, it's a good runtime in general if you're looking for Kubernetes-based systems. Um, there's, there's so much knowledge in here um, that it already takes developers lifetime uh, to create something like this. And yes, one could argue that setting this up in a reasonable, stable and resilient way um, is only necessary once. And that is true to a certain extent, but it also means that we need to think about uh, who's responsible if something breaks um, and these teams still need to know how to fix it, right? I'm painting a deliberate dark picture in this kind of presentation about today's life. I want to wanna make sure that we think about what we're doing, that we are absolutely empowered and aware to slow down our pace whenever we are going too fast. I wanna make sure that we realize how far we came as an industry. What took horses almost 15, 50 million years to evolutionize into something that is called a modern horse. And I, I completely spared you the complete uh, like modern history of horses. So. Uh, all the all the variants you can find today. Uh, that is something that whoever is interested can look up at Wikipedia. But uh, it only took us like 15 years uh, to create this complexity. And our life got a lot faster. What's also important is most of these like early evolutionary stages of horses actually went extinct. So there's only one thingy left, which is the modern horse. Unlike with our technology, our technology stack grew significantly over time. Like very few of these technologies, mentioning Smalltalk, for example, are not that mainstream anymore and kind of on the verge uh, to extinction, right? <clears throat> but ultimately, new inventions cover new use cases. Um, and these new use cases are a big driver for decision makers. Um, these new use cases are probably also mostly motivated out of something that is systems focused. Um, so slash infrastructure focused. I think that what we did not realize so far, and somebody tweeted about it today as like the poster child microservices, uh, so the one service that vendors usually use in their pitch is the scalable lock-in service, right? Uh, yeah, we all do that. Um, and it is an easy example, right? But what is important is the part before lock-in service that's scalable. And that is something that is, uh, that is often ignored these days because we tend to not look at non-functional requirements anymore. Yes, these are the system requirements around like scalability, performance, that is something um, that is easily forgotten. But as a matter of fact, most of these non-functional requirements actually influence the infrastructure. And uh, the architecture on top is something that needs to fit these non-functional requirements. So long story short, just taking the modern horse, just taking the newest bits and pieces out of our toolbox is probably not always going uh, to be a good fit. And another, uh, another kind of story that comes to mind, especially when talking about horses, is, is that wonderful quote from Henry Ford about 
his customers and uh, what they would have answered if uh, he would have asked them what they want. Um, the famous faster horses, right? Um, so this is not the way where, where we ended up with cars um, because speed is not necessarily healthy. And you, especially not if you're not knowing where you go. So that is something that I really strongly encourage you Think about the speed you're going at and think about the non-functional requirements driving your decisions. That is really important. Ultimately, you need to ask these hard questions. It is, it is impossible to just decide on like latest and greatest frameworks which way you want to go. It is impossible to derive this as like a technical decision. This always has to take into account business decision-making and business requirements. And uh, the more I get pulled into technical discussions, I have to admit, um, the more I push back because I really wanna, wanna make sure that we realize why we are doing certain things. Um, this is not for uh, the sake of killing technical debt, right? That is an important part. That is something that we need to do. We need to evolve and modernize and it's, definitely easier uh, if we're in the lead, but it's also super important to realize when to do what and which risks to ultimate, ultimately take. Um, what, uh, what I'm still missing in this talk is actually a unicorn. So this is a unicorn. Um, is that, is that even, is that even a thing? Like, do unicorns exist? So there is a, the British Unicorn Society and uh, they have a book that uh, lists all unicorn appearances worldwide and also shares some like guidance on how to work with them. Um, as a matter of fact, 400 years before Christie's, some, before Christ, somebody, um, somebody wrote about something like a unicorn before. And it's most likely not a horse. It's an entertaining story, by the way. So if you have a couple of minutes, there's a little link to the uh, uh, to a good website summarizing the little we know about unicorns. What I think um, a unicorn to me in this uh, in this kind of sense is the one thing that unicorns are supposed to have is a healing horn. And this is also the reason why I think. Um, we need, to, we need to make sure going forward to not only look for the natural evolution, but also ask us where do we really want to go? What is really needed uh, in terms of our personal career, our developments, where we want uh, our development stack to be? And you basically have, you have two choices at that point. You need to find something that is like the unicorn approach, something that aggressively reduces complexity and gives us back that kind of like developer experience and joy. And don't forget to put some glitter on it because that's obviously how unicorns are seen by little 12 year old girls these days. And uh, on the other hand, you could um, just simply stick to what's proven and necessary and use what is a good fit for your business solutions and implement it accordingly, right? Okay, we have a unicorn. Um, what's missing is coffee. I have coffee. We have more coffee, right? So where's my coffee? My coffee is gone. Okay, nice. So the coffee obviously is uh, the Quacos pitch in this talk and uh, You've seen a lot of talks, at least one by Alex Zoto, and uh, I'm not going to talk about Quarkus that much, but uh, I love Quarkus to death, and it's definitely the unicorn approach. It is something that sparks joy and gives you glitter back, and uh, I, I just love that it fits so neatly into this story. Um, it stands on shoulders of giants. It kind of mixes the the approaches uh, in, in a good sense. So there's a lot of things that you already know and I'm not going to talk about that any further because I do think um, that you already had a chance to play with it and if not, that is a good inspiration to actually do that. 
Last reminder, and I do um, apologize that this is not a technical talk, um, but I did not really meant to make this a technical talk. I meant to um, get us all thinking and uh, you can hate me or love me for that because um, I do think that we as a community need to do something against complexity in our uh, growing new world. Um, we need these changes, don't get me wrong. I'm not fighting Kubernetes or containers in, in no way. Um, I've been playing with the first iterations of it, but uh, it is important that everything is usable and uh, that we get some more fun and joy and uh, productivity back, which is a big thing that I'm missing in, in many cases. And I can't just only provide that one solution to you um, that we obviously have in our stack, which has some really neat developer uh, mitigation effects in there. So if, if you have a chance, for example, look at ODO, uh, which is OpenShift do, it's a little command line and gives you a lot of fun back, um, lets you focus on source code and not focus on everything YAML that's going to, to happen behind. So uh, plenty of good things, but yeah, just keep that in mind. Stay healthy, prioritize, um, focus on what's important. And I'm not usually reading slides, but uh, this is really important to me because I mean, if nobody else has ever said that to you, um, there are people out here struggling. Um, struggling, I've been struggling. I'm still sometimes struggling uh, with everything that's happening these days. And I think that uh, this is actually one of the very few virtual talks that I'm giving this year because I'm missing every single one of you talking to you. And uh, I really would like to have a conversation after this. So if you get a chance to hop on our after uh, conference question and answers, I'll definitely hang around for a little bit and answer more questions and ideas. But uh, there's parenting in a pandemic. Um, there is uh, there's something that is an optimal home office setup. Um, you, you can only distantly imagine what I learned about cameras, resolutions, green screens and stuff over the last couple of months. Um, there's also cooking for me personally. So I, I actually started cooking. Um, so this is something I've, I've never wanted to do. And I've, I've always said we can go to a restaurant wherever we want. But uh, this is giving me time off. This is giving me a new focus. And I really want you to also take this opportunity and uh, carve out some time for yourself, uh, even in these weird times. And uh, I'm pretty sure they're far from over. I usually also don't take a political stance in talks. Um, this is not meant to be one. This is, um, this is a human stance. This is my ask to all of you as a friend wear a mask, protect each other. This is super important. And while you're at it, continue to create legendary code because this is what we all really want to do. And uh, if you did not recognize this one, this is uh, actually one of our fabulous, wonderful um, versions that you can have as stickers. It's kind of the the pitch for our developers program. So developers.redhead.com is something that you definitely need to sign up for. Like not only visit and look around and go, um, sign up, find the sign up button. Um, there's plenty of great resources, definitely, uh, including books. I have a couple of pointers later on. You'll get like an email once in a week or maybe even less. You have an opportunity to join great hands-on labs and everything you can even distantly think of. Um, that is a lot of support in these weird times and a lot of information that you can digest whenever you have time for it. And ultimately, uh, what happens when unicorns uh, really drink coffee? Uh, they want more, right? So, and uh, to those who know me since a little longer, um, coffee is kind of my second name. Um, and uh, this is probably what happens to a unicorn uh, that you give coffee to it just once more. And this is uh, with, uh, with Proud taken from uh, the website Tea Turtle. So if you want to have a t-shirt with that little fancy thingy on top, definitely go there and uh, get your version. Some books, some recommendations, and uh, that's pretty much it from me. Um, I do have a self pitch at the very end. so. Uh, you've seen me all the time here today, but uh, if you can't get enough of, of me, there's a little webinar series that you could definitely join. But uh, that is absolutely promised the last slide for today. 
And uh, I can only say thank you all for, for listening and for being here. And uh, thanks, Ollie, for inviting me. <laughs>